All rise. The Court of Appeals Division One is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. We're here for oral argument in case number JV22-0084, Roland T. v. Jessica D. These proceedings are being video and audio recorded, so we ask counsel to identify yourselves and your client at the beginning of your argument. Each side will have 20 minutes, and appellant's counsel is responsible for watching the clock to reserve a portion of that time for rebuttal if desired. Also, we have read the briefs and have discussed this case at conference, so with that, counsel, you may proceed. Thank you, and good morning. My name is Brett Rigg. I am counsel for the father, Roland Tajes, who is here in the courtroom with me. And, Your Honor, this case is really about fundamental fairness at the court. Roland was told that he was going to be a father after dating Jessica for three or four weeks and having had sexual intercourse on one occasion. Roland at first did not believe her, but then over time became used to the idea and became very excited. He was present at the ultrasound when they found out the sex of the child. They announced together to Roland's mother that she was going to be a grandma, and that was another very happy occasion. They together went and picked out a crib that had been, I believe, Roland's and was kind of a family heirloom together. This all shows that Roland was excited and on the road to becoming a father. That all changed before the child was born when the mother, Jessica, learned that Roland had some criminal matters that he had to resolve and could possibly be incarcerated. At that point, Roland was informed that Ryder was not his child. And at that point, when mother gave birth, she did not put Roland's name on the birth certificate. Counsel, what did your client do after mother told him he was not the father to determine whether he was or was not the father? At first, he didn't do anything. He did tell his mother that, I guess, you're not going to be a grandma. They were upset. It was very emotional. And then later, he did request a paternity test, which went ignored. During the hearing, the paternity test was requested, I believe, after the child was born. I don't know from the record exactly when it was. Many years after the child was born. I believe that is accurate. So in between the time that he heard he wasn't the father and many years later, what happened? Well, mother didn't want anything to do with him. I actually didn't ask you quite that. I asked you what happened. What did your client do? My client did not take any steps to show he was a father until he requested paternity. Which was after there was a motion or a proceeding for severance. Correct. And the child had gone through early childhood with no contact. So given that the circumstances were such that your client thought there was a possibility, a probability, and at one point even a certainty that he was the father, wouldn't it have made sense to follow up and request a paternity test as so many fathers do and bring an action for paternity in a timely fashion? That would have obviously been a better course of action here. I do think that in the testimony that father did testify that he had requested a paternity test from Jessica, but she did not respond to that request before the petition was even filed. But that's what paternity actions are for, right? I mean, you can establish paternity with the help of judicial compulsion if necessary. You can establish parenting time, child support, all those things. None of which happened here, despite the fact that there was every indication that your client was a putative father. 
and and I, I understand that. Um, and my uh, my client was relying on what the mother's assertions were when she told him that he was no longer the, did asked the father. She, did she, he asked how she determined that? I mean, how would she know? He um, the the testimony from the trial does not indicate uh, exactly why why he took that in stride. But I think it was related to the fact that they hadn't been dating very long and had only had sexual intercourse and kind of confirmed what he thought initially that it was he didn't think he was going to be the father. And later when she um, ignored his request for a uh, paternity test, uh, was not responding to him, and they went their separate directions, he took her at her word and thought, well, she she must uh, know better than I. She she knows I'm not the uh, the father, and so is there any statutory or case law that suggests that that course of action uh, is sufficient to avoid uh, termination on the grounds of abandonment? I think on the grounds of abandonment, um, that the termination cannot be based upon deception, and I think that's what occurred here. I think that the um, the court's order even uh, shows that mother did likely. Uh, tell father that he was not the father and and was unresponsive to his test and sure he could have done more um, well, However, these are anything. I mean he, he, he literally did nothing. He just took her at her word and went on for years Not not attempting to follow up, right? That's true. However, once uh, Once there was a termination action filed and he realized that he was a father at that point uh when it comes to fundamental fairness, I think at that point he should have been allowed to reunify with his son and have some of those services provided. That so did you raise the services argument before the Superior Court? No, that I, um, I agree that that was not raised in uh, the Superior Court. However, that is a uh, due process right that I don't believe had to be raised in the Superior Court. I think that that, um, that should have been followed and should have allowed him to uh, to have a fundamentally fair procedure in place for him to show that yes he can be a father and that's something that has been uh, ordered by uh, this court whenever there's reunification services during severance proceedings that that you uh, you need to try to reunify the, the child and parent so so when our court held uh, in 1994 and has held many times since that a parent must act persistently to establish the parent-child relationship however possible and must vigorously assert his legal rights to the extent necessary. What do we do with that standard in the face of these facts? Because honestly, your introduction, which, which um, underscored your client's knowledge of the impending birth of the child and excitement over it, Almost, almost works to his detriment against that standard, unless I'm reading it wrong. That, that is a, a tough standard, and I understand that. Um, I think, though, that in a case like this, when you have uh, a young couple that uh, are really don't know each other very well from the beginning, and there's enough evidence to show that he was on. The, unsure whether he really was a father from the beginning and then she didn't respond to his requests and uh, told him that he wasn't the father, didn't put him on the birth certificate and they went their separate directions. At that point, I think the mother also bears some responsibility here for not uh, well, that, that for not agreeing be, that. That may be true, but the, this case isn't only about father and mother. This case is about a child, a child who's gone six years between 2015 and the case number in this case starts with a 21. So a, a, a child whose entire life has been spent in this, uh, you know, without personal doubt, but to the extent there was any cloud of doubt among the adults, um, it doesn't seem that anybody was giving a lot of attention to the needs of the child for permanence early on. And I, isn't that why we have the legal standards we have? And, and I agree. It is. It, it's. It's sad, and it's a. It's kind of a tragic situation here, where the um, the child did not know anything, and um, and this child has uh, gone through childhood, and that's something that my client will never get back um, to be able to raise his son. However, it take uh, it from him though, I mean, it, it, he. You say he'll never get it back. He never. He never had it. He never took it. He. It was. I mean. He, he didn't. Knew, he knew who the mother was. He knew 
you know, he saw the ultrasound. He, he knew what was going on. And then all it took is one comment for him to completely disappear for six years? I think uh, when he was told that he was no longer the father, when that was um, told that the, the gifts should all be returned, that, uh, that they were none and that he wasn't put on the birth certificate, I think that was enough for him to, to believe, uh, Jessica, that he was not the father and to, uh, to go different direction. Well, let me ask you this, though. Given the vigorous assertion standard that I read earlier, how would you square these facts with that standard in a way that causes us to reverse? Do we have to simply overrule the standard and change the law? I mean, it is, it is judge-made law. We could, we could disregard it, but wouldn't that be necessary in this case? I think that in this case, especially, that, that more weight should have been given to the facts uh, that the mother did not, uh, she was not truthful with, but with the father. I'm asking about the law, not... not and I think that that, that that standard can be, uh, I don't want to say disregarded, but in the situation where, uh, how can he act vigorous and assert his rights when he... Uh, was told rather convincingly that he's not the father and well, by, going on. Court, action, by yeah. going to court and and that's and when he did request a paternity test it went unanswered and no but he didn't he never filed a petition to establish paternity and as a former family court judge I can tell you a lot of my days were consumed with those petitions it's done all the time let's look at the abandonment standard under heiress 8531 um, so abandonment occurs when the parent fails to provide reasonable support to maintain regular contact with the child and including providing normal supervision. So there's no dispute in this case that your client did not provide support, not reasonable or, or any type of support for the child during those first six or seven years. Is that, is that correct? Correct. And that he did not maintain regular contact with the child that's also correct? Correct. And that he did not provide normal supervision. That's also correct. And, and so, so you're asking us to excuse that and, and find that there was not abandonment solely because he um, was misled by mother's comment? It, it, yes. There's, but there's not a statutory or, or other legal exception um, on, I, as you would propose. I do believe that this this is similar to the Calvin B case where uh, where if a mother's deception and non-responsiveness um, is what led father to not pursue his rights uh, vigorously, that that can be considered when, uh, when determining uh, the uh, severance of his rights. And I also, I think that once uh, the petition had been filed, I want to go back to the to the due process, right? And I know he didn't raise this during the proceeding, but under the fundamental fair procedures of due process, I believe that he should have been provided reunification services, and that's imperative in these severance proceedings, and that uh, he should have been given the opportunity to to be a dad, to Does bond with his son. the fact that this was a private severance uh, affect that calculus? I don't think that it should. I think that... Um, that well, does the law require that a private party provide reunification services? Because this is not a case where DCS was involved. Correct. DCS was not involved, and um, but I think that the that no one had to provide the actual services. But I think the judge could have uh, ordered that a guardian ad litem be appointed. I think the judge could have ordered that uh, that visitation be be allowed. Um, there was. Uh, the, this was an abandonment ground, and I don't think that there was any uh, evidence to show that the father uh, could not have been provided visitation and show that he could reunify and show that there was this bond and given the, uh, the chance to, to show that he can be but a dad. Why is, it the, why is it the government's responsibility to bring him in and try to show that he can parent um, in a situation such as this where he has done nothing and there's someone else who is providing uh, that parenting? Apparently there was a, a, a father figure from the beginning or early on. And it comes, it comes down to the fact that he is a father. And this is, uh, this is one of the, the greatest rights that you can have is to be a father. And that he, uh, as a father, has a due process right that once it, the paternity was established, once it was clear that, uh, that he had been 
deceived that he be given the chance to uh, reunify and that those services could have been provided and should have been provided. And I think that uh, that this is a situation where just because uh, DCS wasn't involved and mother wasn't uh, under scrutiny that he still should have been allowed to reunify with his son. So I'd like your, to, oh, go, go ahead. Go so ahead. it's your position that due process requires that a court sua sponte order services in situations such as this? I believe that it is. I believe that that there shouldn't be a, a difference between the fact that this is a private severance case or a DCS severance case, that uh, that reunification services are imperative in severance proceedings. That's that's the case law. If, if this was any other situation and DCS was involved, that would have been the case. I don't think For, that you can avoid that. Under an abandonment ground? Whenever there's a, a petition to sever uh, the parents' rights, that the reunification is, is uh, imperative in that situation. Let's circle back just very quickly to Calvin B, which you cited earlier for the proposition that when mother interferes, um, that's a factor that the court should consider. In that particular case, uh, the father actively sought more involvement with the son than mother would allow. Um, they had been married and divorced, and uh, in the dissolution decree, there was visitation allowed to the father, and the father visited every chance he could. You know, visitation was um, made less and less over time, um, but but you have a father who is actively participating. Isn't that very different from what we have here? And and that does read differently. However, in that situation, he knew he was a father, and here um, he was told that he was not the father and wasn't on the birth certificate and didn't have any reason to believe he was. Just, you know, if you're buying cribs and going to ultrasounds and then you hear you're not the father, I, I would think the normal response would be to say, how do you know that? Did, did that, was that question asked? Because it, 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 if, for example, he had been duped by having mothers say, I have a paternity test and Mr. X is the father and, you know, sorry, but DNA proves, proves it all, it would be a more compelling argument than if he just didn't even ask. Is there any evidence that he asked? There, there was testimony in the, during the trial that he requested paternity, but I agree there wasn't a, a court action to, to establish paternity before the well, severance but, but was filed. But did he ask mother what her basis for her assertion was? During the, uh, the trial, that did not uh, that, No, I mean that around come the time that she denied his paternity. Right. In, in 2015. Did he ask then? And that's not, that's not clear from the record is what I'm saying. Okay. And I'll reserve the, uh, the remaining time for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Good morning. I'm Eduardo Coronado, and I represent the appellee, Mother Jessica Donetso. Um, and... I know that the appellant, um, the overall argument is that it's fairness, and mother is not necessarily disputing that because that should be the nature of every court hearing, every court proceeding, fairness. Although mother does disagree that it's about fairness because uh, appellant had every opportunity. Well, did he though? I mean, we, we've, we've sort of dragged your colleague over the coals about how lackadaisical father may have been, but did your client tell father he wasn't the father? It, she did. I, I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood the question. Did, did, did she, she say to uh, the appellant, you're not the father? No. Um, I was not the counsel in, in, um, in the trial. No, but, well, but there shouldn't have been Counsel involved. I mean, I'm talking about at, around the time of, of the birth when when appellant just disappeared from the scene. He says that was in a response to a statement mother made, which turned out to be false, that he was not the father. Did that happen? According to my client, no, Your Honor. In reading the the transcript of the of the trial, she testified that that was not the case. That she never told him that he was not the father. So he just, poof, disappeared into thin air, um, had nothing to do with his disclosure of, of criminal issues or anything like that. He just, he just decided after going to ultrasounds and buying cribs that he was out and never called again? That, that, that's, that, that's, a, that's a bit of a tough pill to swallow also. 
I, Your Honor, my understanding that is that's exactly what happened. Now, Mueller may not have wanted anything to do with him because he had a criminal past and they, and, and they had a short relationship and probably didn't want to develop that relationship. But that does not excuse Father for not availing himself of every opportunity which he had here. And uh, again, in the, in the transcript, I read it. There was nothing that... So, so but, but I'm trying to understand your ver version of the facts, which is, which is still very hazy to me. You're saying that, that one day after all this involvement, father just never calls and mother never followed up either. All the child support, visitation, everything that could have helped with the raising of her child, it just wasn't worth a follow-up call or text or anything like that. That, that's almost as hard to believe as as the other side's story. And, and that might be true, Your Honor. Um, but she didn't, uh, like I said, she didn't want to foster the relationship between both of them, and that doesn't mean anything or goes to anything regarding the best interest of the child. She didn't um, pursue him being involved in his life, uh, I suppose, because he didn't show any interest. As far as him not being on the birth certificate, um, I don't think she could have put him on the birth certificate because they were not married. Um, so that doesn't... I, I, I think you, you may need to check that assertion. Um, and, that, and, and that might be right. Um, but um, nonetheless, uh, really... Did she put anyone on the birth certificate down as the father? I don't believe she did, Your Honor. I don't believe she did. Uh, but I believe that this case is about responsibility, and the responsibility here really, uh, if, if the appellant really wanted to be in the child's life, had the opportunity to do that, and really had an opportunity to do that um, six years. If this years. case is about responsibility, that may not be your strongest argument, because I'm not... I'm not hearing anything to suggest that there was responsibility practiced uh, by your client. Your client may succeed under the prevailing legal standards, uh, but, but I'm not seeing that your client acted responsibly in this situation either. Well, I understand the court's concern regarding that, Your Honor, but there's nothing in the record that suggests that um, the child was in any uh, emotional uh, danger, had any emotional or physical um, concerns regarding the child. Um, so she did act responsibly when it came to raise the child. She might have not um, availed herself of of the response of of the ability to ask for child support, for example. Um, or been completely candid when it came to naming the father on the birth certificate. I, I'm not sure about that, Your I'm Honor. Not either, but but I'm, I'm, it's if she didn't list anyone, then it's it's really hard to see why. And, and that could be right, Your Honor. But but um, that well, aren't the facts of this case that uh, at least according to mother, they only had sexual relations once, and so there was some uncertainty as to who the father might be. I don't think there's any uncertainty on her part, and, and the court is correct. Um, according to what I read and my understanding and talking to my client, um, they only had it, of course, at one time. Um, but as the court knows, that's, that's all it takes, and, and actually, that's all it can take. Um, but so, if, But if your contention is that she knew who the father is, then the responsibility argument seems to slip further down the hill as we look at the birth certificate, as we look at the complete absence of communications. That, that, that's, not, that's not terribly helpful. Well, I don't disagree that it's not terribly helpful, but when it comes to responsibility, she did act as a responsible mother, whereas father did not. He had complete knowledge that um, not only 
was it possible that he was the father, but that it was probable that he was the father. And we arrive at an interesting question then, really, whether whether a woman who is pregnant has a responsibility to seek out uh, that potential father and uh, make sure that his rights are honored. I don't think the, the law says anything um, to that effect. There is the question, though, of whether she interfered with his ability to establish his uh, parental rights, although he didn't really pursue those as we've talked about uh, extensively. Well, I, I agree with the court. That is that is the question whether she does have that responsibility. Um, but I think she broached that responsibility and transferred it over to him. I don't know if transfer is the right word, but when she said, this is your child. Um, now, if she really believe or try to deceive him in any way, why did she invite him? To well, him? and is there even a legal responsibility for her to tell him this is your child? Or does the law provide uh, the opportunity for him to sign up in the putative uh, father's registry and to keep tabs on this person he's had sex with in case he has impregnated her? That would be his responsibility because um, mother, of course, knows this is her child. She's going to carry the child for nine months. So there's no question there, but there is a question when it comes to him. Uh, in this case, she did not, she did not, she wasn't um, obscure in any way or deceitful in any way with him. Uh, there, there's no evidence that she was deceitful to him. He argues that, he, that she told him, this is not your child. Throughout the record that I read and talking to my client, she she adamantly denies, denies that and says, I told him and I never told him otherwise. But I think going to an ultrasound with, with a woman that's pregnant that's telling you this is your child is a big step for that woman. I mean, that would be incredibly deceitful for a woman to say, this is your child, come over and sit down at, uh, to an ultrasound with me uh, to find out what the sex of the child is. And she didn't do that. She did that because she understood that that was his child. Uh, so I, I think that's being responsible. I think that that's responsible of her saying, sitting down and saying, hey, you know, I, I, um, I don't know where this relationship is going, but we're having a child, and by the way, we have an ultrasound. You're invited to come with me. That, and that is responsible on her part. On the other hand, he, he alleges, now the court kind of skipped, uh, the, the trial court kind of skipped over that and said, um, okay, let's assume he's correct. Then why didn't you take these steps? And just as your honor, I do a lot of family law and a lot of my cases, I'm not trying to vouch for anybody, but a lot of my cases are men who are in a very similar situation, which is they had a relationship, but the relationship didn't pan out. It's his understanding this is his child. Um, the lady is not wanting to do anything with them, and the child is born now, so they want to see him, and, and we file for establishing the paternity. And then there's no question uh, whether she didn't want a paternity test, or he didn't want it, or he didn't pursue it, because the court's going to, if anything, it's going to make an order that says, OK, let's get a paternity test. He's saying that's his child, so we're going to find out. He didn't take that. And he didn't take that for that opportunity for approximately six years. And um, the appellant argues that uh, it should be regarding fairness and due process especially. But due process is due when you avail yourself of that. And he didn't. And the fundamental right that the appellant is arguing um, is correct. A parent has the fundamental right to parent a child. But that only applies when you avail yourself of that responsibility, because it is it is a responsibility. And in this case, the appellant didn't. Uh, but um, 
the appellant is arguing that due process requires the court to provide reunification services. Um, it, to put that burden on, uh, I guess the burden should have been on mother in this case, or maybe in the court, um, when he could have done that for himself, he could have requested that if he would have filed a petition for paternity, he could have requested parenting time and establish that relationship, but he didn't. And after six years, he just wants to walk in and say, give me, give me parenting time. Um, I think there is a big difference between a, uh, when the state is involved, DCS, or a private person. But, in, but, when the, but I think that even when there is the state involved and the sole issue is abandonment, that's kind of tricky because then, then any, any father, any, or well, sometimes a mother, if they've abandoned the child for years after birth, um, then the abandon, abandonment um, part of the statute of, of the statute um, would kind of be rendered useless because if, if the, in this case, the father comes and says, well, it's been six years and they are trying to serve my rights for abandonment, give me, give me uh, parenting time, and then that cures it, then the abandonment statute is out the door. We might as well just erase it. So that is, I, I believe that that is, and not that the court cares what I believe, but um, it, it's just an argument that really, um, hinders really the the ability in this case of the child to have a um, um, consistency in knowing who the parents are in this case um, going to best interest Mr. Donetso is willing to adopt um, he's happy to adopt that's what he wants to do that would provide the stability and and um, what the child needs so um, Regarding the issue of whether um, uh, reunification services, I, I think that um, Jessica P. versus the Department of Child Safety, 249 Arizona 461, uh, states that if a parent wants certain, certain um, services that it should be requested during the trial and there's nothing in the record that I can see that he requested that. I, I don't even think that the court would have granted that, but he didn't. We would be talking more about it if the court would have denied it, but he never asked for it. Um, so in this case we have um, the mother raising the child, taking care of the child, and, and the father here, the appellant, failing to do even the minimum to try to establish a relationship. The best interest test is met because Mr. Donetsu is willing to adopt, which confers upon the child a benefit, which is required for the best interest test. And as far as due process, uh, the appellant was afforded the due process that is afforded to any other putative father, which is a hearing and, and um, a judge to determine the outcome. And that, that is what due process is. Um, mother requested the court affirm the decision by the lower court, the trial court, and Thank you. Thank you, counsel. <clears throat> Thank you. I just want to close by pointing out that there were no requests for child support from the mother. She did not list anybody on the child on the birth certificate. 
she didn't want Roland to be in her life. And that the record shows that it came about because she didn't want to have someone who she perceived to be a criminal to be the father of her child. And so she ignored him. The court's order... Counsel, what weight would you like us to give to the fact that she didn't ask for child support? How should we weigh that? What what bearing does that have? I think that, that supports that... Um, the order also says father asked for a paternity after uh, being told he was not the father. So that's what the court had concluded. I think that that shows that uh, that she was doing affirmatively doing things to try to prevent him from being a father and believing her that uh, that he was not the father. So it was so not asking for child support uh, was an affirmative effort to preclude him from parenting. Correct, to, to deceive him and to keep him from being a father so where, that he wouldn't challenge him. Where is there legal authority that says that a woman who becomes pregnant is somehow compelled to ask for child support? What if she can afford to raise the child herself and doesn't want to ask for child support? There is no legal authority that she asks for child support, of course, but uh, but I think this shows the type of deception that, um, that I was alluding to also in the Calvin B case where she is trying to take steps to prevent him from realizing he's the father. And I think that that is just one of the facts to show she wasn't requesting child support. She was also not putting him anybody on the birth certificate. She was doing whatever she can to keep uh, him believing that he was not the father. Those, those facts, I, I think, certainly operate in your client's favor. But then the question is, faced with those facts, faced with her apparent intransigence, did he vigorously assert his rights? And I think that he relied upon her, her statements and that he didn't because he... Uh, he took her at her word, and that's also uh, what the lower court understood. I would also just like to to point out that in the uh, case of in-ray appeal in Maricopa uh, County Juvenile Action um, 171, Arizona 90, it says that the court should sever the parent-child relationship only in the most extraordinary circumstances when all other efforts to preserve the relationship have failed. All other efforts to preserve the relationship have failed. I believe it includes reunification services, and it's not limited to a situation where DCS is involved. Wait, I think that, is that connected to the abandonment ground? That is connected uh, to the due process ground, that he was not uh, allowed due process to show that he could be a father when he um, stop for a second in. there, and I know we're coming to the end, but as uh, counsel for a mother, stated earlier, uh, there are due process rights, and they are there, right? They're, they're in the, and there's the courthouse every day. Right. And, and one must avail themselves of those rights, right? You have to walk into the courthouse and file documents, and then you can say, even though I was pursuing my rights, I was blocked from pursuing those, and that's not what we have here. And, and I agree with that, and I, I also was not the trial counsel. However, I, I believe that some of that is because this was a private termination, and there is a, a belief that you cannot ask for reunification services since DCS is not involved, and I think that is incorrect. I think the, uh, the constitutional right is, in any situation, you have to preserve that relationship, regardless if it's uh, brought by the state or brought privately. Thank, thank you. Thank you, counsel. We thank you both for your arguments. This matter is now taken under advisement, and we will issue a written decision in due course, and now we will take a brief recess to prepare for the next oral argument. Thank you. Thank you.